Buenos días. Bienvenidos a este webinar hacia una nueva política del agua, inclusión de la ética y la diversidad cultural en un futuro de precariedad hídrica. Parte del espacio y conocimiento del Instituto Mexicano de Tecnología del Agua. Eh, antes de comenzar, daré unas breves eh, explicaciones. Pues les pedimos, por favor, si ustedes tienen alguna pregunta, la pueden escribir en el chat del Zoom en español y nosotros nos encargamos de traducirla. El desarrollo de la sesión será en español y en inglés. Eh, también les agradecemos que puedan seguirnos a través de Facebook y Twitter. Eh, todas las sesiones de nuestros seminarios están en línea para que ustedes los puedan consultar cuando tengan oportunidad. Continuaremos en inglés. Good morning to all. Welcome to this seminar. Toward a new water politics, embracing ethics and cultural diversity in a water scientific solution. For, uh, for this espacio conocimiento en línea of the Mexican Institute of Water Technology. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you also by Zoom and Facebook viewers. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type, type them on Zoom chat from room Of if you have watching them from Facebook Live, please do so and comment during in the box. We will have a round table after the presentation, also a question and answer sessions where we will try to answer as many questions as possible. You can type the questions in Spanish and we will translate them for you. Also, all the sessions will be recorded and available afterwards in a social medium. So please make sure to follow us if you want to rewatch it at any time. Uh, today, we have a special host. I'm honored to present you to our general director, Mr. Adrián Pedroso Acuña. Before giving the floor to Dr. Adrián, I would like to present you to our special guest. Today, we have... Um, Today, uh, we have the participation of David, uh, Dr. David Feldman. He is professor in the Department of Human Planning and Public Policy and Political Science at the University of California, Irving. He also serves as director of water at the University of California, an initiative that facilitates collaborating among faculty, students, and regional public agencies or in questions of water science, technology, and policy. Prior to the University of California, he held post as chair of political science at the University of Tennessee and has an energy and environmental policy analysis at Oak Wright National Laboratory. His PhD is from University of Missouri, and his bachelor is from Kansas State University in Ohio. Dr. Feldman, served as lead author for the U.S. Climate Change Science Program report on climate and water published in the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, was a principal investigator on a National Science Foundation project with Australian universities on water reuse and conservation, and in other projects in Israel and the European Union. His current work as director of water at the, U, at the University of California entails managing projects on contaminants of emerging concern in drinking water, policy challenges in protecting equality, equality in the use of data and information about water agencies, agencies, reforming water policy in California and the public acceptability challenges for water supply innovations, publications, of note include water policies governing or amounts precious resources, the water sustainable city science policy and practice, the practice, the police, policy, politics, environmental policy in Russia, the geopolitics of national resources, and water policy for sustainable development, and water resources management in, in search of an environmental ethic. He has also written Um, or collaborated nearly 100 articles and book, book chapters. Also, I, will, I, wa I want to introduce you to Senadora Alejandra León Gastelum, 
Senator uh, of the Republic of the State of Baja California. She is a Mexican politician and environmental activist. She is the environmental chemical engineer and a law graduate. Also, she, was, she has a master's degree in environmental education. As a senator, she is currently a member of the Environment, Natural Resources, and Climate Change Commissions, among others. She has held positions as director of ecology in the municipality of Mexicali, citizen counselor of the Baja California Environmental Protection Council, and president of the Centro Integral de Medio Ambiente y Salud. Also, I want to present you uh, al diputado Diego Eduardo del Bosque Villarreal. He's a congressman from the state of Coahuila. He is an, an agronomist in rural development from the Antonio Narro Autonomous Agrarian University. He is currently a member of the committees of the chambers of deputy, uh, deputies of the environment, sustainable, sustainability, climate change, and natural resources. But the first in, that, in rural agriculture and full death sufficiency and development and conservation. So today we have a very, uh, very great panel. And also, well, I give the floor to Dr. Pedroso to start these important sessions. Thank you to all and please be welcome. Thank you, Malinali. Well, um, First of all, I, I would like to, to thank you all, our visitors and obviously our, our special guests to, for sharing this morning with us, for the generosity of their time and uh, for the generosity as well to share their views on a topic that obviously touches everything on earth. in our lives. Dr. Victor Toledo, it is my pleasure to, to welcome you and to share this with a great deal of evidence that the decisions that we have made in relation to water perhaps are not the, the, the best ones. We are currently living a water crisis that is uh, not only a consequence of the dangerous overlap between climate change and population growth, but also is a result of uh, the separation of water, uh, of, conceptualist, of the conceptualization of water, uh, apart from the territory. And what I mean from this is that in the current model of development that we have as humanity chosen, we have decided to use water as a resource, only as a resource to be extracted, to be exploited. And uh, we have uh, overseen uh, other dimensions of water such as justice, uh, just such as equity and, and such as a, a key element that can actually promote development uh, with these dimensions in consideration. And uh, for this, I am very, very grateful uh, to Professor David Feldman because he's going to put uh, the, 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 a, a topic on the spot and a topic that uh, is not usually uh, seen as necessary in water decisions. And this is the use of precisely ethics and the cultural diversity. Um, it is also very important to, uh, to acknowledge the presence of the Senator Alejandra Leon and the Congressman Diego del Bosque that obviously shows that Mexico in, in its Congress, Mexico in its government, and Mexico in its society, it's growing in maturity. It's growing uh, the ability to discuss uh, topics, these important topics that touch everything. 
we in the Mexican government are convinced that water can be an element that promotes economic development, that promotes well-being for everyone. But this has this being said, uh, everyone means, first of all, those that have been forgotten, those that have little or nothing. And that's uh, uh, our motto to say something. That's what President Lopez Obrador has uh, put as a, as a compass that guides our steps towards a better Mexico. Ethics and how ethics connects with water. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for sharing this morning. Thank you, Professor Feldman. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Diego. Uh, and well, we're looking forward to start and to listen uh, to this important discussion. Many thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be with you. Uh, can you all see my slides? All right. Okay, very good. Uh, so, uh, as was mentioned, I'm going to be speaking this morning on toward a new water politics, embracing ethics and cultural diversity in a water sensitive future. I want to begin by uh, introducing a framework that I have found to be useful in teaching about water ethics and cultural diversity. And I call it a framework for understanding water politics. At the top, you'll see the word process, how governments make water policy, and key questions that you and I often deal with in our everyday work is at what governance level should a problem be addressed? And is the problem contentious? And of course, increasingly water problems are very contentious. A reality in making water decisions that we're all also aware of is power, which is differential. Not everyone has the same authority in any society to determine policy choices over water. And we often ask some very normative questions, ethical questions about power. What are its sources? And are the outcomes exercising power on behalf of water perceived as fair? Which brings me to the blue outline circle on the bottom right, and that is purpose. Process, power, purpose. What are the goals of participants in water politics? And there are two key questions, I believe, and that I have studied throughout my career on this issue and which I'm gonna share with you uh, today. One is what ethical values should guide water decisions and what cultural beliefs matter to citizens. As much as we might uh, deny this, this is actually the domain, uh, the domain where uh, ethics and culture matter most, when we talk about purpose. So with that, let me talk a little bit about why I think ethics and culture even matter in discussions about water politics. I alluded to the fact that water politics is a purposeful enterprise. If we stop and think about it for a moment, all of us who participate in water politics engage in it because we're seeking ways to better our lives through the management of water. And that's a fundamental, I would say, a fundamental ethical principle. We want to better our lives. And that purpose, while it may differ among each of us in various ways, determines our motivation to participate in decision-making. We should also acknowledge, of course, that purpose is based not only on ethical principles, but on cultural beliefs. Here I show uh, a figure that I know many of you are familiar with, the Zolotawa Tigres Dance on the Hill for Rain. This is important, I think, because each and every culture throughout the world has groups that identify with this kind of ritual. And what I think it symbolizes is something that we are too easy to dismiss, but must not dismiss if we're really in favor of improving a sound water policy. And that is that beliefs are molded by history, by custom, by traditions, even by religion. 
And some cultures exalt water as having, as we know, spiritual significance due to its life-giving property. Uh, while we live in a modern era where we put a great emphasis on science and behaviorism and engineering and making decisions, I would urge us, and, and I will show reasons why this is so in my talk, why we must never disregard this kind of approach toward water. It is important to people living in our society and it is important to meet their basic purposeful needs. So why do we ignore ethics and culture? And I would say that there are some very practical reasons why we tend to kind of bracket out of discussion. Uh, water politics traditionally, as all of you know, tends to focus on harnessing rivers and groundwater for very practical purposes, to protect societal assets and to generate other benefits. This is why we dam rivers to uh, avert flooding, for example. We also, of course, harness rivers and use groundwater to irrigate farms and to slake the thirst of our growing cities and communities. Political scientists like myself have often said that this emphasis on harnessing tends to produce what we might call path-dependent governance, where decisions are kind of shaped by the way we've always done things. Oftentimes we make decisions, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes unknowingly, in a top-down manner. Because we're experts and because we know how to serve these three purposes, this is the way we approach decisions. This is not only top-down, but it's often not very democratic or inclusive of all interests in society. And it may be biased toward unsustainable practices. This illustration of Ojos Negros, many of you are familiar certainly with this region, much more familiar than I am. I am familiar with it through my research through secondary studies. But as you know, uh, groundwater pumping in this region has lowered the water table and has impacted wetlands by drying out marshes. Some would say that this is a classic tragedy of the commons issue uh, and that some sort of regulation, probably through an enforced withdrawal permitting system, is needed to rectify the situation. Let me suggest that this decision making is not simply something that's based merely on science and engineering, but it it is based at least implicitly on certain ethical assumptions that people need water, that we should manage it in some wise way for present and future generations. And I'll come back to that point in just a little bit. As a political scientist, I would be remiss if I didn't concede that another reason why we often ignore ethics is because social scientists like myself often discount these sort of what we might think of as soft principles in favor of things that we can more easily measure, like uh, how people vote or how people express their opinions in uh, public opinion surveys. However, I hope that we will all acknowledge that ethics and cultural issues have very persistent voices in our societies especially among some social scientists, certainly among urban and regional and water planners, and among many citizen groups, activists, uh, such as Rodrigo Mundaca, who is a uh, very renowned activist on water policy in Chile. Uh, and these activities point to the importance of keeping promises and commitments to ensure not only abundant and safe water, but to ensure that decisions are legitimate and equitable. Uh, one of the uh, challenges facing activists like Rodrigo is the fact that uh, his country is one place, not the only place certainly, where access to water has been increasingly privatized. And in effect, uh, the role of sound ethical decision-making, if not totally pushed out of the arena, has certainly been put on a sort of back burner in favor more of efficiency, shall we say, and private property. So I simply use this example to illustrate the quandary that I think we face when we talk about the struggle of getting ethics and cultural diversity on the political agenda. So 
how do we move forward? How can we think about a water sensitive future that's grounded in ethics and how might we bring this about? And I wanna use this uh, as an example. Uh, this uh, is based on some work that's been done by Robert Costanza uh, at Yale and some of his colleagues in global environmental change. And basically, uh, Costanza and his colleagues argue that if we stop and think about it, our well being depends on uh, harnessing uh, resources uh, and, in fact, managing the natural and human capital in the environment. One of the challenges we, uh, we face is the fact that uh, our well being not only depends upon this, but human capital and the built environment are both really parts of society, and they are also very much uh, embedded uh, in nature. Having said that, it is also a fact, I think, that the destruction of nature not only harms nature, but it harms society, and it harms our long-term well-being. So we need to appreciate more, and this is certainly something that environmental communities have tried to implore us to think about now for uh, well on 50 years to think about the built environment and built capital and social capital as being embedded in nature and that human well-being depends upon how well we can coexist with nature. So what does this mean in terms of acknowledging ethics? And let me suggest some things that uh, may seem commonsensical but I think are often not uh, acknowledged sufficiently. Let me contend that all societies defend water policies on ethical grounds. When we decide to build a dam, when we decide to uh, uh, channelize uh, water or to divert water from one region to another, we're making decisions that we are defending on certain ethical principles. They may be implicit, but nevertheless, they are in the background. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that ethics resolves around, revolves around what makes an action right, an outcome good by some measure, or some decision virtuous. There are, as I'm gonna discuss in just a few moments, three dominant approaches that in fact we actually see embedded in current water policies around the world that have ethical significance. Utilitarianism, satisfying the greatest good for the greatest number of people through promoting economic growth and efficiency. The categorical imperative, a tradition that some believe began with European philosophers such as Immanuel Kant. Others believe the categorical imperative is perhaps also embedded in the Judeo-Christian tradition. I happen to believe that. The notion that we are obligated to treat others as we would wish ourselves to be treated by keeping promises and adopting decisions that we would apply to ourselves. And finally, last but not least, stewardship. Not only caring for other people, but caring for all forms of life out of rational self-interest and out of a deference to a higher moral authority. The acknowledgement, in other words, that we did not create nature, that nature was created and we're somehow embedded in it. These three quotes on the right, I think, it, uh, examine in different ways, sort of different uh, tacit acknowledgements of ethics. Uh, in Mark Twain's case, uh, sort of a, a cynical, but I think uh, a, a, a notion that kind of resonates with many of us today, that it's really all about money and power. Uh, on the other hand, is Benjamin Franklin's notion that uh, there's great utility in protecting water because when we run out, we're in trouble. And last but not least, Sextus Julius Frontinus, who, when supervisor of water supply for the city of Rome some 2,000 years ago, uh, really acknowledged what I would call both a stewardship and a categorical imperative that it is the obligation of societies to care for water so that there will be sufficient water supply for the future and for the present, and to remind ourselves that that's exactly what our predecessors have done to make it possible for us to have the blessings of clean, safe, potable water. 
So let's look at these principles. And I wanna use some policy illustrations to show how we actually do this. These are pictures of two very significant dams that control the Colorado River and thus quite directly control the water supply not only in seven states, but in of course a portion of Mexico as well. And that is the Colorado River. Uh, this quote at the bottom was a statement made by President Franklin Roosevelt uh, some uh, 90 years ago now, nearly 90 years ago. And I won't read this quote, you can read it for yourself. But what I find very, very interesting is how embedded in this statement is a clearly utilitarian notion of water ethics and water policy. That the Colorado River, when it was unregulated, when it was a free flowing stream, added little of value to the region the dam serves. And that having built this dam, we will now be able to ensure great economic benefits to millions of people. Now, without debating whether or not that has turned out to be true, let me add that some 30 years after this dam was built, we in the United States built another dam further upstream called Glen Canyon Dam uh, on the right. And this project was based on the very same principle. If one dam can produce these benefits, two dams can produce even more, can store water, can provide flood control, can generate power, can provide water for irrigation. Uh, this principle tends to favor efficiency and the benefits of water for the greatest number of people. But let me suggest to you that uh, there are some obvious problems with this approach if carried to an extreme. And this is another American example, but is one that I think is ubiquitous and well publicized. Many of us are familiar with the case of Flint, Michigan where some five years ago now, and it's difficult to believe, there was a discovery that corrosive water was leaching lead from centuries old galvanized iron pipes. Uh, this was affecting the health of people in the community, in particular, the health of the most vulnerable populations, the elderly and school age children and even younger children. Uh, local officials, state officials in Michigan, and the United States Environmental Protection Agency at first tried to reassure the public uh, and residents by saying there was no health problem, uh, that they were using anti-corrosive phosphates. That was not true. In some instances, it might have been because somebody thought they were and didn't check. There's evidence that some may have simply been lying that is to say, not living up to integrity. Uh, we now know that this crisis could have been averted if precautions were taken. The lack of funding was an initial excuse. But now, in fact, just uh, within the last week, the state of Michigan has now agreed to provide some $600 million in a special fund that will be de dedicated almost entirely to monitoring and to addressing the mental and physical health problems of children from this lead problem. Let me suggest to you that what the protesters, as you can see on the bottom right, were really emphasizing is that no one should ever be exposed to this risk and that water agencies and those who govern water policy have an ethical obligation to treat others as they would wish to be treated. And that is to ensure that water is safe uh, and secure and protected. And that they must not only carry out this covenant or contract, if you will, but this is a promise. And if they fail to meet that promise, they have violated an ethical principle and not just committed a public policy error. Last but not least, to continue my illustration, and I apologize for using American United States examples here, but I think the examples are good examples in making the point, and that is stewardship. Uh, and in particular, the example I would use is the Endangered Species Act, which first came into existence in the 1970s. The interesting thing about the Endangered Species Act 
is basically this was the first time in the United States and perhaps one of the first times worldwide when a national government, a Congress, uh, one wonders, certainly I wonder if our Congress in the United States today would be willing to pass such a measure. Uh, this, uh, this law was basically founded on a stewardship principle that there are other species that are threatened by the way we have managed or mismanaged water. Those species have not only an extrinsic value, that is to say that they benefit society in various ways, but they have an intrinsic value, aesthetically, ecologically, educationally, historically, recreationally, and scientifically, and that we as humans and as decision makers have a moral obligation to exercise methods and procedures to bring them to the point at which they will not be threatened with extinction. That is really the insertion of an ethical principle, in this case, a stewardship principle into actual public policy. And it was quite a revolutionary idea. Uh, it has continued to meet with great uh, uh, controversy in the United States today, as many of you know, as similar measures adopted in other countries have met. And oftentimes the criticism of this measure is that a fish is not worth the economic benefits of flood control or water supply. So why are we worried about endangered species in California such as the Delta smelt? What possible economic benefit do they serve? Final observation I'll make on this is that without the stewardship principle embedded in this law, we would probably not have Delta smelt today. Let me turn to the issue of uh, culture and, uh, and the new water politics. And what I'm talking about here is acknowledging the roles of kinship, gender, faith, and land tenure in how people value water. Essentially, what I'm arguing is that culture is the sort of social manifestation of how we manage and deal and insert ethics into policy. Uh, culture helps us understand how societies determine what tools, whether it be the use of free markets or the use of regulations, are considered most appropriate for solving problems. Uh, there are many, many cultural influences on water politics, but in the interest of time today, I've decided to focus on four that I think really drive home the point about the importance of ethics as being part of the embedded culture and how we in every country must confront water issues. Religion and faith, the issue of gender and gender justice, community-based values as opposed to simply nationally-based values, and the perceived role of government. Uh, this quote from uh, the Water and Cultural Diversity Statement of the World Health Organization, I think uh, really sort of underscores where I want to take this, that water has a strong cultural dimension and without considering and understanding the cultural aspects of our water problems, no sustainable solution can be found. And I wanna say a few things about religion in this. Uh, religious leaders often articulate explicit views on the environment. This is true in Mexico, it's true in the United States. We know it is true throughout the world. It is found in various scriptural writings. It has been reinforced in present day policy statements. To use simply one tradition as an illustration, I make no uh, claim here that this is the only tradition, but it's a tradition I'm familiar with. I know you are familiar with. The Judeo-Christian tradition acknowledges the interdependence between humans and other species. It does place humans in a morally superior realm of, of stewardship. Uh, these two uh, sets of verses from the uh, Old Testament, or what is sometimes called the, the Hebrew Bible, I think underscores the importance of water and culture and ethics in ancient societies. On the right is a figure that has been generated by what is called the eco-justice movement way back in the 1990s. 
And this was an offshoot of the environmental justice movement worldwide. Basically, it argues that in dealing with water and in dealing with the environment, uh, while a social justice paradigm wants to address human needs, while an economic justice paradigm seeks to embrace economic welfare, and while an environmental justice paradigm seeks to protect the environment, at the intersection at these three domains is something which eco-justice theorists, that is to say, those who uh, are embedded in this Judeo-Christian tradition and have tried to get us to think about water and environmental ethics, is something called eco-justice or creation care. What it underscores is two things. And that is that all three of these paradigms are intrinsically interconnected and cannot be ignored. If we try to uh, slant policies toward one of these three circles and ignore the other two, we're being incomplete in terms of our calling. Uh, likewise, the other thing that's underscored is that the achievement of true eco-justice for water and for other resources means that in all of our decisions, we take into account human needs, economic welfare, and environmental protection. This is uh, easy to say, easy to argue, but is it really achievable? And this is what I want to devote my further remarks to this morning. These are two illustrations, and I could use many, many more, but I think these two illustrations are very effective in noting the way in which uh, religiously inspired or faith-based inspired groups actually are trying to insert these principles into debates worldwide on water policy. On the left is something called the Council on American Islamic Relations. Uh, and as you can see in this article, which of course uh, you will have the opportunity to look at again and again, uh, the notion that if you want to teach fishermen, very appropriate metaphor, is it not? If you want to teach fishermen how to protect fish and to protect water, you can do so through law and policy, or you can reach them through the Quran, something that they already strongly identify with and want to live their lives to, at least in Zanzibar and Tanzania. Likewise, the Ecumenical Water Network is a worldwide Christian water network founded by the World Council of Churches. And as you can see, uh, this is something in which uh, there are efforts to organize people around the world on an annual basis to pause and take a moment to think about how they can work in their communities to bring about a more ethical water situation through using their faith in a policy environment. So I, I think these two uh, efforts show the connection between ethics and practical change, trying to reach people not only through their head and not only through law, but through their heart. I want to say a little bit about gender roles in water politics. This is an issue that I think all of us are increasingly familiar with. Uh, surveys that have been done under the auspices of the uh, United Nations, the World Health Organization, and UNICEF show that women and children bear the primary re responsibility for water collection in most households. Why is this significant? Why is this both an ethical and a policy challenge? Well, this is time that's not spent working at an income generating job and caring for family members, in the case of children, attending school. So this is not just uh, an ethical outlier, it's an ethical principle that plays directly into water policy. I wanna cite this example, which many of you are much better familiar with than I am, but this is something that has uh, come out of a case study entitled Water and Sanitation Management with a Gender Perspective in Mexico. This is a study that I've drawn on in my own research, in addition to this presentation, 
And I really think there's an important ethical message embedded in this study in terms of water policy. If we are serious about water policy reform, as I know you all are, and that means legal reform, uh, and we believe in gender equity as a principle for the reasons that I discussed on the previous slide, then we must commit ourselves to real policy actions. And that means removing physical impediments to irrigation and other water systems. It means reforming land tenure systems to ensure that women, as well as men, can inherit land and can obtain collateral rights to manage it. And it will require legal reforms to ensure that women, as well as men, can participate in irrigation collective meetings and hold leadership roles. So this is a very practical connection between water ethics and culture, as we've discussed, and water policy. I want to say a little bit about community-based values. One of the criticisms of water politics and one of the uh, strictures of what we might call the new water politics, which seeks to embrace ethics and cultural diversity, is moving away from a top-down approach to water politics to a more bottom-up approach. Uh, this is obviously something that's actually going on uh, in Mexico right now. This is an example of a cooperative agreement along the New River, a cooperative agreement between Mexico and the United States as of uh, over about a year and a half ago now. And I'll let you read the details on this New River Improvement Project. But what I find really fascinating about this is that this is an initiative in which the basis are locally centered laws, rules, and practices for water management. Now, aid agencies and non-governmental organizations unfortunately overlook these practices when proposing legal reforms. The proponents of this reform quite boldly describe what they're doing as bioregionalism. In other words, enabling sustainable actions in a transboundary watershed not limiting themselves to a single country and not limiting themselves to a political domain, but saying, uh, to get back to our earlier paradigm about nature and the built environment being embedded in one another, is to say that we need to think about watersheds as bioregions and embrace them even when they transcend political domains. This kind of approach encourages local self-help on a practical basis, it can not only protect water quality, but it can reduce public health risks. And it matches remedies to problems with the informal water economies uh, of many countries, not Mexico, but the United States and elsewhere. Not a panacea, but a start. And certainly something that I think underscores the importance of ethics, culture, and water. I want to turn very briefly to an example that I've studied in my own research. Uh, and it uh, is what I call incorporating community-based knowledge in water politics. This is an example that I find really fascinating. It's from Nigeria. And basically, it's an initiative that was begun from the bottom up. It's called the Joint Wetlands Livelihood Project. And it's an effort to build local water resource management capacity but it is supported by the United Kingdom, the government of Nigeria, and the World Conservation Union. The goals are to the, improve the use of local knowledge for water resilience, to restore the economy and the ecology via the building of political consensus. There's much I can say about these two pictures, but I simply want to underscore a couple of things. One of the skeptical approaches that you often hear when we talk about using community-based knowledge is, well, local uh, communities don't often know what their water needs are, and they don't often have access to sophisticated technologies to be able to take control of water. Well, I use this example because in this particular instance, these community members, these farmers, sitting around playing this water management game, are basically role-playing solutions to water problems. On the floor in front of them is a 
a map in cardboard of the watershed in which they live. And basically what they're doing is they're debating different solutions, brainstorming methods to maintain income and produce uh, crops with less water. They prioritize their methods by voting. The results become a basis for bylaws that are then followed as a kind of social contract by the farmers. And then the users discuss how other institutions can assist them. And then they review and they reflect and they evaluate and specify actions. And as you can see, they even engage in breakout discussions. What is very significant about this room where this game is taking place is two things. No one has a laptop computer and there is probably no immediate access to electricity. So they are using the most expedient available methods open to them. But guess what? It works. It seems to me there's a lesson that all of us can take from that. Last but not least, I want to talk about the role of government or the perceived role of government. Uh, I could use many examples. I want to use this example from Chile. Uh, the water code back in 1981 uh, transformed water into a form of private property, which allowed rights to be freely bought, inherited, and sold. The incentives were designed to encourage investment and speculations during periods of scarcity and to lead toward rapid economic development, particularly in rural areas. Uh, one of the things that we know about this situation is that indigenous communities were especially adversely affected. They were also adversely affected because uh, following the water code reform, was a law of mining concessions, which granted special rights to water for those who put it into what was called productive use. Now, after 1993, there were reforms that tried to take things in a different and more indigenous focused direction, allowing native people's ownership over their ancestral lands and water. Uh, the process of purchasing back land and water rights means that the state continues to favor large sectors. And as these maps on the right show, in the meantime, environmental damage has occurred. What kind of environmental damage? The increasing loss of land cover, which in many cases is irreplaceable and has also exhausted local water supply. So I want to conclude today by talking about environmental justice and putting these principles into action and adopting water innovations. And I want to suggest to you that in fact, when we uh, adopt any kind of water innovation, whether it be conservation, whether it be desalination, whether it be wastewater reuse, whether it be rainwater harvesting, is that we naturally tend to think about technical feasibility. Do science and engineering support our options? That's a good place to start. But ladies and gentlemen, it is only the starting point. We also then want to consider what is economical and fair. And that means what is affordable and equitable compared to other alternatives. Thirdly, we want to then go beyond economics to environmental impacts and risks every alternative to provide water supply, building a dam, diverting a river, recycling wastewater can have adverse effects. The question is, can those effects be mitigated in such a way as to conform to the ethical paradigm that we've been suggesting is important? And finally, public acceptability. Does the public not only trust, but do they have a voice in shaping the various options we put forward. This bottom figure is something that some of my colleagues and I came up with in what I call the water sensitive city, which is basically figuring out a way to recycle and reuse every drop of water and to use the household domain as a way of rethinking the new water politics. I wanna briefly uh, play out this system that I've talked about by thinking of some of the common controversies that 
uh, you and we and people worldwide are dealing with. Seawater desalination. Uh, it is a practical and technically complex technology. People often raise questions about its cost, its energy consumption, whether it entrains endangered and threatened species. We talked about the importance of that. How do we dispose of the salt brines? And of course, aesthetic and siting principles. Do we acknowledge public concerns in citing them? In California, as in other places, uh, we have opted in some instances toward desalination without either endorsing or rejecting desalination. Let me suggest that in licensing this particular project just to the north of San Diego, which went into operation uh, a little less than five years ago, some answers that had to be provided were first, the availability of renewable energy. That was considered to be very important since this is a highly energy consuming project. The existence of diffusers to minimize the adverse environmental impacts of brine. And long-term equitable rate agreements so that the public consuming this water would not be burdened with hugely uh, high costs of water from this desalination plant. And the integration of this technology with other sources so that we were not relying totally upon this one source, but we're also mixing it with other sources. And tools to enhance public confidence, including allowing public monitoring, uh, constant monitoring and input in the co-management of this project. Not a panacea, but a step in the right direction. There are some lessons that can be taken from Israel, a country that I've worked in. Uh, Israel has gone very, very strongly toward desalination, for better or for worse. Uh, but they argue that desalination should not be treated as a panacea. That they also need to reuse wastewater. They need to employ water conservation measures. And there is a broad political consensus that water is a security issue, which means that they also need to cooperate with neighbors, in particular Jordan and increasingly Palestine, to make sure that they prudently manage all regional resources. Again, not a panacea, but I would argue by doing so, they have been able to overcome many objections. And then finally, last but not least, wastewater reuse. At the bottom is the uh, late actor Wilford Brimley. This is a, a satirical take on wastewater reuse, which is meant to try to appeal to people's sense of humor, porcelain springs. But the point being made here is that basically all water is recycled. Using Southern California as an example, where we uh, spend a lot of time and effort in uh, doing recycling. There are questions of cost, energy consumption, health impacts, integration with other sources, and the social stigma of using wastewater. This is the groundwater replenishment system here in Orange County. It is the largest wastewater recycling system in North America currently. How were the concerns addressed on this extremely expensive project? Well, I won't say they were addressed perfectly, but one of the things that decision makers understood is that in less affluent areas and those with environmental justice concerns, such as Southern California, reuse can arouse mistrust, especially among underrepresented groups. To become accepted before decision makers adopted this option, they assessed and compared each and every feasible option. They ensured that management agencies are perceived as trustworthy and competent by incorporating public input and still incorporate public input and oversight into this technology. The operations are transparent. Anybody can visit. There are publicly available reports on the performance of this system uh, available to everyone. 
and implementation is perceived as being equitable. The recycled wastewater is not targeted only at poor segments of the population, but on the entire population served by the water agency that developed this technology. The picture at the top is good public relations. Our former governor in the middle, uh, Jerry Brown, showing with other uh, decision makers drinking water from this groundwater replenishment system. By the way, it's called a replenishment system because it's indirect potable reuse. The wastewater is injected into our groundwater basin. It reduces the need for imported fresh water and it reduces wastewater pollution as well. I want to conclude by suggesting that to embrace ethical and cultural issues in water politics, we need to move from a traditional paradigm of environmental justice for water toward what I call a newer idiom of environmental justice in water. The old idiom says that the risk of water problems is potentially high in consequence and in probability and fall on the poor women and minorities. The hazards are threats to human health and well being. The conflicts are high intensity, and as we know from worldwide experience, they often are accompanied by high intensity conflicts, protests and demonstrations, and acute short term actions. Dam building, the relocating of displaced populations, the diversion of rivers, major pollutant spills, and other crises. Uh, Flint, Michigan would all be examples. And of course, water privatization in developing countries. Let me suggest that that old paradigm still exists, but we need to recognize that there is no, a newer idiom. We are approaching an era in which the risk of water problems are not only potentially high consequence, but have great uncertainty associated with them. How will climate change affect water quality and water supply? These are not questions we can, any of us, reasonably and immediately answer. So we need to be tentative and forthright in the way we approach these issues. Threats to health and well-being are possible, but broader welfare issues are also at stake. The cost of options to address climate change, their affordability, the access to all of our citizens to safe and secure water and actions to address our legacy problems, such as waste. These conflicts, I would contend, will probably be lower in intensity. We may see social protest, but the problems will likely be perceived as long-term and chronic, and they will generate public resistance to change, as expressed in public meetings and internet campaigns and, and elsewhere. Wastewater reuse debates are already showing this issue in my country, in yours, elsewhere. Efforts to mobilize against desalination plants. Public concerns with contaminants of emerging concern and the debates over who's responsible for these contaminants. Reactions to the imposition of involuntary conservation measures. And water supply privatization, not just in developing countries, but in every country. So let me leave you with some thoughts. Rather than look for the best options as water managers, decision makers, and scholars, seek the most adaptive solutions that are ethically and culturally palatable. Solutions that have a low probability of failure, that generate as few negative consequences as possible, that conserve resources for renewal and innovation, that incorporate lessons from our previous experiences, and that rely on active public engagement to ensure trust and confidence. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Professor Feldman, for this uh, really, really nice uh, presentation and introduction of on how ethics can be included um, in the generation of a new water policy uh, elsewhere and obviously in Mexico. Uh, to comment on your presentation, we have two special guests, as I, I, I 
previously mentioned. Uh, and just before I, I give the word to them, um, I, I will uh, give some uh, instructions uh, for our participants in Spanish. Eh, como ustedes saben, eh, el profesor ha terminado su presentación. Los invitamos a que nos hagan preguntas, por favor, en, en, el, en el chat room de Zoom o de Facebook, de tal suerte que eh, las podamos, eh, a, se las podamos hacer al profesor Feldman al terminar las intervenciones de la senadora Alejandra León y el diputado Diego del Bosque. Eh, nos parece muy importante en el instituto que eh, tener eh, la opinión de la senadora y el diputado, porque como ustedes saben, hoy día estamos en eh, el camino, hemos iniciado el camino a la construcción de una nueva ley general de aguas. Inicia cuatro iniciativas están en discusión en el Congreso y justamente esta, este seminario que el profesor Feldman eh, nos impartió el día de hoy nos permite ir eh, conduciendo el proceso de discusión sobre elementos muy importantes eh, como son la ética y la diversidad cultural, ¿no? Para un país como, como el nuestro. Entonces, sin más, eh, le voy a dar la palabra a la senadora Alejandra León, al tiempo que le agradecemos mucho su presencia eh, y el tiempo que nos dedica para comentar eh, justamente la presentación del profesor Feldman. Por favor, senadora, el, el piso es suyo. Adelante. Ya. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Muy buenos días a todos ustedes. Eh, yes. Gracias al, al, al INTA, Adrián Pedroso. Gracias al doctor David Fetman eh, por su excelente exposición. Eh, concuerdo en su totalidad con todo lo que nos han expuesto. Eh, gracias a la Secretaría de Medio Ambiente, al doctor Toledo, que bien ha sido un gran luchador también por este tipo de, de justicia ambiental y que en el caso de nosotros como luchadores en la defensa del agua en Baja California, hemos dado una gran lucha en contra de una transnacional que es Constellation Brands, eh, esta empresa cervecera transnacional que se ha querido instalar en Baja California eh, y donde su mayor producción sería la cerveza eh, para exportarla a Estados Unidos, principalmente el mercado sería eh, California precisamente, pero sin embargo esta lucha jurídica, social y legislativa que emprendimos desde hace más de tres años eh, ha sido fructífera gracias a la política ambiental de nuestro presidente licenciado Andrés Manuel López Obrador, Gracias también al apoyo del IMTA y de la Secretaría de Medio Ambiente, quienes estuvieron presentes, precisamente en Mexicali y Baja California, eh, en este tema de esta lucha ambiental por el derecho humano al agua. Eh, esta ardua lucha en contra de tanta corrupción e impunidad de gobiernos anteriores en nuestro país, pues, hasta el día de hoy todavía precisó nuestro presidente en su mañanera Constellation Brands. Ese tipo de transnacionales no se pueden establecer en el norte de nuestro país, ya que pues, eh, es en su mayoría desierto, carecemos del vital líquido que es el agua. Y sobre todo, pues bueno, el agua de Baja California depende en su mayoría del río Colorado. Es una cuenca binacional. Eh, de varios estados de, de, la, de Estados Unidos y, y de México, depende también eh, además una parte de Sonora y en su totalidad casi Baja California del agua del río Colorado. Por eso es nuestra lucha. El propio presidente Donald Trump ha declarado una emergencia eh, ambiental eh, de líquido del agua de, del río Colorado. Eh, estamos ante una sequía en esta parte, eh, pues entre Estados Unidos y México, por lo cual debemos de cuidar en nuestra agua del río Colorado, eh, que abastece, como lo repito, a varios estados 
de Estados Unidos y también eh, tanto Sonora y Baja California por la parte de México. Es una cuenca binacional muy importante. Los flujos del agua del río Colorado que desembocan en el Alto Golfo de California tiene también que ver y genera un impacto eh, al desarrollo de la vaquita marina, un tema también eh, de índole internacional y que se tienen ya también algunos estudios donde se percibe y se determina que al no haber este flujo del río Colorado hacia el Alto Golfo de California ha influido notaria, notablemente en la extinción de la vaquita marina. No, tanto, no es tanto la pesca, es, es eh, que ya no hay condiciones estuarinas en el Alto Golfo de California, ya que no llegan los flujos adecuados para la reproducción de esta especie. Eh, pues simplemente decir que vamos a, a dar eh, todavía en la parte legislativa como bien mencionaba nuestro compañero eh, Adrián Pedroso, tenemos pendiente la aprobación y, y el estudio de una nueva legislación en materia de agua. Vamos a trabajar de la mano con los expertos y sobre todo cuidando que haya esta justicia ambiental y que no se privatice el agua. También en varios estados de México, eh, pues en algunos ha estado privatizándose el agua, sin embargo en Baja California eh, hemos también tenido una lucha en contra de la privatización del agua así que eh, estaremos nosotros colaborando no nada más con los expertos en México, tenemos una agenda binacional con legisladores de California y este y con ellos también estamos viendo el tema del agua y de la contaminación y la calidad del aire entre las ambas Californias. Es muy importante por ello, eh, pues este seminario tan, tan enriquecedor que, que nos hizo el doctor Feldman. Y eh, agradecerles a todos ustedes sus atenciones, pero eh, sobre todo estamos a la orden en el Senado de la República eh, para tocar cualquier tipo de tema referente al agua. Eh, también en esta, en esta lucha de, de la justicia ambiental por el agua, pues hemos estado abundando un poco más en, en el tema. No somos expertos, pero sí hemos tratado de investigar, de colaborar con todos los expertos en la materia. Eh, el agua en un futuro para todo el mundo, no solamente para México o Estados Unidos. El agua pues, va a representar de, pues, un tesoro, un tesoro para todas las naciones. Eh, estoy de acuerdo con que las desaladoras también este, no es precisamente eh, pues, la solución al problema del acceso al agua. Sin embargo, pues tenemos que empezar a ver y tomar medidas adecuadas tanto para el cuidado del agua, su reciclado, su reutilización, pero sobre todo eh, en el consumismo también tenemos que empezar a marcar esos límites eh, con estas grandes transnacionales como lo es las plantas cerveceras, pero también pues hay otro tipo de plantas transnacionales que utilizan muchísimo el agua. Yo quiero agradecer nuevamente a Limta, a Semarnat y al profesor David Feldman por su excelente, excelente exposición y que concordamos, concordamos con lo que nos ha estado exponiendo. Quiero mandarles un saludo a todos y ponerme a su disposición. Estoy a la orden y trabajar en conjunto por eh, mejores justicias ambientales sobre todo en la materia de nuestro vital líquido, que es un derecho humano, lo, como lo es el agua. Estamos en una gira de trabajo ahorita por todo Baja California y el tema principal precisamente es la carencia del agua en el estado de Baja California, como lo será 
y lo es en muchos otros estados de México. Muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes por sus atenciones, por su invitación y pues un gran abrazo al profesor David Feldman. Muchas gracias, eh, senadora León. Gracias. Por sus palabras. Eh, nos parece que, bueno, evidentemente este es un tema de larga discusión. Eh, esta, esta presentación que hemos, que hemos, de la que hemos sido testigo hoy nos permite abrir boca ¿no? en, eh, respecto a pues, las necesarias discusiones que necesitamos tener. Y yo rescataría del comentario de la senadora justamente que hoy en México vivimos momentos de cambio de transformación en las instituciones y en la manera en la que se hace política. Y la senadora nos dio un ejemplo muy claro que incluso el presidente mencionó en la mañana. Eh, la decisión respecto a la cervecera en Baja California fue una decisión tomada considerando a la gente. ¿no? Esto que nos platicó el doctor Feldman en su presentación de una decisión que se toma en un despacho por expertos lejos del territorio, es muy fácil que genere conflictos si no consideramos a la ciudadanía. Por eso me parece que estamos viviendo momentos inéditos en el país, eh, lo estamos viendo y, y nos da mucho gusto tener al profesor Feldman para hablar de ética en los temas de agua. Doy ahora la palabra a, a nuestro queridísimo amigo, el diputado Diego del Bosque, para que también nos acompañe con su reflexión respecto a la presentación del profesor eh, David Feldman. Por favor. Diputado, muchas gracias. Gracias, Adrián. Y este prometo que voy a aprender inglés. Ya estoy traduciendo este, para que sea más fácil. Y felicidades a el doctor David Feldman. También me gustó muchísimo su, su exposición. Y saludos a la senadora Alejandra, activista social y gran representante de del pueblo mexicano. Siento mucha admiración por ella y le mando también un, un gran saludo. Eh, voy a... este Bueno, eh, creo que estamos en México saliendo eh, del peor escenario posible. Eh, este, tenemos eh, una devastación ambiental muy grande. Eh, este, ha habido crecimiento solo para algunos y este, de, tenemos un problema social muy grande. Tenemos más de 50 millones de personas en la pobreza. Es decir, que la devastación que se hizo del medio ambiente con un eh, enfoque utilitarista, pues no se tradujo en bienestar para la población. Entonces, creo que tenemos un gran reto. Eh, lo han documentado mucho las personas de la Secretaría de Medio Ambiente. Más de la mitad del territorio nacional está concesionado a empresas mineras en áreas naturales protegidas, contaminaciones de ríos, eh, contaminación industrial, hay verdaderos infiernos ambientales, porque la contaminación ha generado múltiples enfermedades este, cancerígenas. Eh, tenemos el uso de más de 80 sustancias tóxicas para la agricultura, encabezada por el glifosato y otros tantos. Y bueno, pues todo se ha manejado de que el desarrollo económico o el interés económico de algunas empresas está por encima de comunidades y de la naturaleza. Entonces tenemos, creo, ante nosotros un gran reto en México, cómo poder lograr desarrollo económico que se traduzca en un bienestar social y en una también conservación de la naturaleza, que sabemos que a nivel mundial pues, hay una crisis ambiental que ya nadie puede negar. Me parecen muy importantes cuatro de los puntos que da el, el, el doctor David. Este, el tema de género, este, creo que es importante. Se acaba de aprobar el tema de que este, las mujeres también puedan ser comisariados ejidales, este, pero aún siguen este, pendientes otros grandes temas que con gusto sí, este, podemos ir trabajando desde la Cámara de Diputados, como lo que lo mencionaba, el acceso a los distritos de riego que al final pues, son las mujeres las que más este, cargan sobre sus hombros con la eh, falta y el acceso al recurso hídrico. Eh, los valores comunitarios me parece fundamental. Eh, son los ejidatarios, son los comuneros de México los que mejor conocen la naturaleza, los que mejor conocen sus recursos naturales y los que más han hecho en este país por conservarlos. De tal manera que si seguía con el proyecto eh, político que teníamos de 
despojar a ejidatarios y a comuneros de sus tierras, pues iba a ser también un golpe certero al medio ambiente. Son las comunidades que se mantienen más cohesionados, las que más protegen su entorno y sus recursos naturales. Creo que definitivamente las comunidades y los ejidos son la reserva moral de este país, hay valores distintos y hay una concepción muy distinta de los recursos naturales en el que el agua, entre uno de ellos, pues no solamente es un recurso que hay que entubar y que hay que utilizar para ciertas actividades, sino que es un recurso vital con el que hay incluso cierta identificación cultural y hasta religiosa en algunos casos. Este, y bueno, pues sí, al, al revés de, como dice nuestro presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador, tiene un dicho muy famoso que es que la corrupción se combate de arriba hacia abajo. Creo que este tipo de proyectos se tienen que construir de abajo hacia arriba, porque insisto, son las comunidades, los ejidos, las que conocen la historia de cómo se comportan los recursos naturales y pues creo que es mucho más efectivo que ellos desarrollen sus propios proyectos de gestión del agua que eh, a que se haga desde unas oficinas centrales con criterios a veces muy limitados. Eh, este, eh, y bueno, aquí lo vemos, ¿no? Eh, completamente de acuerdo para la justicia ambiental, no solamente tiene que ver la factibilidad técnica, que es importante eh, que sea económicamente viable, pero creo que también tienen que ser proyectos que se construyen con las comunidades y que son aceptados por eh, todos para que todos puedan ser este, exitosos. Eh, yo soy de Coahuila, eh, aquí también está la Constellation, la, la transnacional cervecera, solamente que aquí ya tiene varios, varios años operando. Yo estuve ahí en Nava, Coahuila, este, pues les decíamos de la importancia de defender el vital líquido y pues nos preguntaban cuál era el vital líquido, si el agua o la cerveza, pues es una discusión eh, muy complicada, la que no me quise meter, pero eh, aquí la, lo fundamental es de que este, a diferencia de Baja California, la gente no se organizó con la suficiente fuerza y pues impuso ese, esa empresa cervecera. Pero el norte del país es una zona del semidesierto donde pues hay escenarios a veces muy dramáticos. Tenemos ejidos en la laguna donde los ejidatarios tienen que hacer filas de varias horas para recibir sus dos cubetas de agua que les tocan para consumo humano al día mientras enfrente hay sembradíos de alfalfa que utilizan riego rodado, que es una forma muy desperdiciadora de regar, para las vacas de leche lala, ¿no? que, que, bueno, que es una cuenca lechera grandísima, y los ejidatarios pues, están ahí viviendo que los animales tienen más derecho al agua que ellos mismos, y no es que no deban tener derecho los animales, pero sí es una eh, situación muy trágica. Hay ejidos de aquí donde les venden a 15 pesos la cubeta de agua, que no tienen concesión para pozos de agua, mientras a unos cuantos kilómetros hay empresas mineras que tienen más de 15 pozos de agua concesionados. Entonces, pues, estamos viendo aquí que hay una gran inequidad en el, en el acceso al agua. Hay solamente algunos otros ejemplos, ejidos que tienen que viajar una hora y media de terracería hacia el ejido más cercano que tiene pozo de agua, a comprar también este, este líquido actualmente, este, eso pues creo que no se puede permitir. Decía la senadora con razón que en el norte del país no se deberían permitir estas transnacionales que utilizan grandes cantidades de agua. Aquí tenemos la cuenca de lechera del ala, la constellation y la idea de empezar a utilizar el fracking, que este, digo, el presidente ha sido muy tajante en que no se va a permitir por lo pronto esa práctica. Entonces, bueno, estamos ante una situación en el norte y en todo el país de este, una injusticia hídrica. Son las, los ejidos, la, las regiones periféricas de las ciudades las que más sufren de esta falta de agua, pero también hay ciudades, por decir, en la capital del país que tienen este problema de la falta de acceso al agua. Y veía ahí algunos comentarios en el chat que voy a, a, a aprovechar para, para comentar. Eh, eh, Estamos en la Cámara de Diputados y en la Cámara de Senadores en un proceso de discusión de la ley general, de una nueva ley general de aguas, queremos que sea ley general, este, en donde, bueno, ha habido una discusión muy amplia. Hay cinco propuestas que son, sobre todo, tres, la propuesta ciudadana de agua para todos, una, dos propuestas de Morena, que digamos están ahí con algunas diferencias, pero tenemos ante nosotros la posibilidad de hacer una legislación que precisamente eh, pues re, reivindique que el derecho al agua es un derecho humano, 
este, y corregir algunos enfoques que creemos que han hecho eh, daño a nuestro país. De 1917 al 92, que se aprobó la actual Ley Nacional de Aguas, se entregaron 2.000 concesiones de agua a privados. Desde que se aprobó esta nueva ley, en el 92 a la fecha, se han entregado algo así como más de 531.000 concesiones de agua, de las cuales la mayoría están ya sobreexplotados y vemos que esto ha sido un desastre en términos de justicia hídrica en el país. Pensamos que hay un, interés, hay un derecho legítimo de, obviamente, empresas privadas de utilizar el agua para la agricultura, para la industria, para todo lo que se tenga que utilizar, pero no puede estar este derecho legítimo, insisto, por encima de los derechos de los mexicanos a tener acceso a agua potable y, y de calidad. Este, entonces, les, les, les adelantamos, estamos en ese proceso de dictaminación. Obviamente, como todas las leyes que nos han tocado discutir, hay un fuerte interés de la iniciativa privada por conservar las cosas como están. Eh, insisto, bueno, pues es una visión eh, respetable, pero creemos que eh, el cambio de, de visión es que dejar el, el control de los recursos naturales al interés, únicamente al interés privado, ha traído consecuencias desastrosas para este país y, y tenemos una postura distinta y, y creemos que esta, por eso esta charla creo que es muy interesante, la nueva, en el nuevo enfoque, la nueva política que debe haber hacia el agua, que no solamente sea, que sea técnicamente viable, que no solamente se garantice que va a haber beneficios económicos, sino que también se, se garantice por encima de todo el derecho de la gente a disfrutar el agua para lo más indispensable. No puede ser... Que, que, insisto, hay eh, empresas muy rentables que tienen acceso ilimitado al agua y que al mismo tiempo exista gente que no tiene agua ni para bañarse ni para consumo básico. Y, y bueno, estamos en, un, en una transición política en donde, por decir, en, el año pasado en la discusión del presupuesto en la Cámara de Diputados, se planteó la, la idea de aumentar un poco el pago por derechos del agua a las grandes empresas y bueno, pues hubo una este, terrible ahí, eh, este, batalla mediática en contra de los diputados de Morena, planteando de que pues, le estábamos dando un golpe a los campesinos cuando de lo que se trataba era... que es normal en un cambio de gobierno, pero nuestro compromiso es este, eh, pues que la justicia hídrica sea una realidad y creemos que la nueva ley general de aguas que va a salir, eh, que la nueva ley general de aguas que, que, que estamos discutiendo, pues esperemos que cumpla estos huecos y que este, cumpla con esta nueva política hacia el agua que nos mencionaba el doctor David Feldman, que se toman en cuenta los derechos de los ejidos, de las comunidades y también de la protección al medio ambiente. Y creo que también en medio de esto un reconocimiento al INTA que está haciendo un trabajo extraordinario desde mi punto de vista, está con esta propuesta de ley modelo de, de sistemas comunitarios de agua que cumple con la idea de que sea de abajo hacia arriba como se elaboran las políticas públicas y todo nuestro respaldo a esta nueva visión del agua en la que los beneficiados sean todos los ciudadanos y no solamente unos cuantos. Muchas gracias y gracias doctor David Feldman por su tiempo y por su brillante exposición. Gracias Adrián Pedrosa. Muchas gracias eh, Diego por tus palabras y, y tu reflexión. Eh, antes de pasar a las preguntas quisiera yo compartir con todos ustedes que el día de hoy salió publicado en el diario La Jornada un artículo del doctor Víctor Toledo que se titula justamente por la vida. Eh, en este artículo, una reflexión sobre antes de compartir con ustedes el gobierno, ¿no? Que, o que motivan nuestro que hacer. Eh, por un lado, en, en temas de agua, desde luego. Por un lado, eh, vamos a, de la mano de, desde el...
Tenemos, tenemos una pequeña complicación con la conexión del doctor Adrián Pedroso, pero en breve él, él vuelve con nosotros. Mientras tanto, eh, tal vez pudiéramos plantear una pregunta al doctor Feldman. Doctor Feldman. If you agree, can we ask you this one question while Dr. Pedroso com, comes back with us? Yes, sir, ah, okay. Gracias, Perdón. doctor. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Mali. Una disculpa, se nos cayó aquí la, la red. Eh, estaba yo diciéndoles que el último principio axiológico que justamente es la transparencia y la rendición de, cuen, de cuentas por parte de los servidores públicos, porque algo que ha, también hay que reconocer y que desde el gobierno, que observamos es que hay una rotura en el tejido social, digamos, en el tejido de confianza entre la sociedad y el gobierno, que viene desde luego por la, la actuación del gobierno en años anteriores. Entonces tenemos también que reconstruir esos vasos comunicantes entre gobierno y sociedad que nos permitan tomar las decisiones de manera conjunta. Eh, habiendo dicho eso, pues empezamos con las preguntas que nos hicieron favor de... Eh, de escribir en, eh, en el chat room. Uh, I'm going to start, Professor Feldman, with the questions for you. Um, we have a, quite, a, quite a bit of, uh, of questions, so let's start. Uh, from, from Juan Alberto Mesa, uh, he asks how to harmonize the human right to water with an ethical approach? What is the priority? Professor. An excellent question. <clears throat> For me, it begins by uh, not placing the primary emphasis on what we might call the right to water, but the need for water. And the reason I make that distinction is because in the social sciences and in the humanities, too often when we start with a notion of rights to something, we transform it into a kind of a property right, mine versus thine. Uh, all human beings have a right to water, but more fundamentally, each and every one of us has a fundamental need for water. So what I prefer to start with is to think about our duties as individuals to one another to ensure that that need is satisfied. And at the same time, to then harmonize the satisfaction of that need with the satisfaction of all other life on the planet. If we start from the premise of human need and our duties to satisfy those needs, then the human rights to water will be met, I believe. But without placing the emphasis on sort of individual, what's mine as opposed to what's thine. So we start with assessing needs, transforming those needs into duties that must be enshrined by practice and by policy. And then each of us taking responsibility to make sure that those needs are met as our duties, the duties that we're called upon, and further to protect all forms of life. I suppose you could say my approach would be somewhat of a hybrid between a categorical imperative and stewardship. 
Many thanks, uh, Professor Feldman. Another question from uh, Veronica Totolwa. Uh, she asks you, is it possible to harmonize in initiatives in multicultural environments with different worldviews? That's a great question. And I believe fundamentally it is possible, but I also believe it creates perhaps the most insurmountable uh, policy obstacle, political obstacle that we face in today's world. Uh, how do we actually reconcile differing worldviews? And I think for me and, and in my research, <clears throat> where this starts from is a recognition that there are diverse and divergent views that will probably never be fully reconciled. But we have to start, I believe, from the standpoint again of, of acknowledging that even though we might have different worldviews, we all fundamentally inhabit this single planet that has finite resources and that regardless of the kinds of cultural differences we may have, uh, at least from my studies of culture, each and every culture uh, bestows a value on future generations. If we share a concern with future generations, and if we're willing to concede that uh, some of our differences are not fully reconcilable, but that we all have these basic needs that can only be met by collaboration, then I think what we can do is we can address uh, those problems, uh, we, we're not going to be able to solve perhaps right off the bat the major problems. Should we divert a river? Should we build a dam? Should we do uh, X, Y, and Z? But we can at least agree on small wins. How do we make sure that each and every child on this planet has access to a safe, potable supply of water? so that that child can grow into full adulthood and then make decisions of her free will as to what kinds of values she uh, would like to, to embrace. Just as we, you and I, have had the right uh, by emerging into adulthood to assuming those values. So start with need, start with the fundamental premise that all uh, societies, despite worldviews, want to secure a future to, uh, to their children and to their children's children. Many thanks, Professor. It's cer certainly the uh, intergenerational responsibility is key also in uh, paving the road towards uh, agreements in water policy. Another question from Kathy Martinez is which policy actions must be taken, taken by Mexico to have a better water, water ethics, economics, access, and also sustainable actions to manage contamination problems? Yeah, another excellent question. I think the starting point to addressing all of those problems is to make sure that in the process of formulating decisions over contaminants, pollution, water supply, and access, that relevant publics are incorporated in each step of the process by which decisions are made. Going back to my framework at the very beginning of my talk, what I like to emphasize is that power while unequal, process while inevitable, and purpose while Un universal, we all have different purposes, are interconnected. We may not initially agree on fundamental purposes uh, and we acknowledge differentials in power. So the default to address these problems is to make sure that we get the process right. If we make sure that the process actually is held to account and is responsive and receptive and open to every person affected. And for me, that really starts with the least well-off. 
the, the most well-off are already represented in the process in Mexico, as in the United States, as in elsewhere. So making sure the process is open to actually gather the input and the values and the preferences and the concerns of the least well-off. For me, it has to start with that process. If you can get that process right, I think the decisions that will be forthcoming will be better decisions. And I think they stand a better chance of addressing these fundamental water needs that you, you have noted in your question. Many thanks, Professor Feldman. Um, another in very interesting question is uh, from Asela, and she's saying, why to carry on with the, with the integrated water management framework that, uh, that despite the efforts of uh, social participation and inclu inclusion uh, has, have been, uh, have, 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 have been, uh, have been taken the decisions from a, an economic perspective only, uh, sacrifice, obviously making a sacrifice towards the uh, rural communities and the most vulnerable sectors in the society. Please. Yeah, I think, I think your question points to a very fundamental conflict that we find in water policy, water decision making uh, in pretty much every country. And that is that water agencies, government agencies, decision makers uh, often feel that they're very much under pressure to make decisions that maximize economic benefit and that place a premium on what is thought to be efficiency, which is the most amount of water for the most valuable uh, end uses uh, at the least cost or at the lowest cost. Uh, my problem with that dominant paradigm is that we have seen repeated examples of where that approach uh, not only damages the natural environment, if, if it is not checked by an awareness of natural constraints, and it ignores equity. Uh, basically, it interprets any gain in economic benefit as sort of trickling down and benefiting everyone. And yet we have repeatedly seen, uh, I've repeatedly seen in my Commonwealth of California, examples of where we place such a great emphasis on the massive benefits and outcomes of water decisions that we don't pay enough attention as to who is actually getting those benefits. And more importantly, what groups are not getting those benefits. So for me, there has to be an equity calculus. Before we make any decision, we need to ask ourselves, how will this affect the least well off? And will the least well off have some voice in this decision? And even take that a step further, getting back to the categorical imperative. Pretend that I am among the least well off. Put myself into, that, into the shoes of that individual. Would I actually endorse the very policy that I am embracing and saying our society should endorse and embrace? If I can't honestly say that because I don't want to be harmed, then that probably says I'm not really thinking about the equity factor. Many thanks. Fantastic uh, reflection on this. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the empathy that we can have also with, the, with this, with the less favored individuals of our society, uh, it will it will actually make things possible with regards to change. Um, another question from Carlos Burciaga is, um, if you think that uh, with regards to the water problems, uh, the strategy of building big dams, creating uh, irrigation districts to, uh, to obviously generate food, and uh, products and uh, employment uh, is the way forward uh, with regards to water. 
what are what are your impressions on this? Yeah, uh, I uh, I have a couple of impressions. It's a very good question. Uh, in some parts of the world, uh, building large irrigation systems where there are no such systems and where there are great demands for food and fiber may still be a course of action that is warranted. It is, however, very difficult for me to envision really any place in the world in which we need to continue to build large dams. I'm not even sure there are really places that we can continue to build large impoundments without doing great harm to the environment. I'll use the example of China, which has invested heavily in major dam projects in recent years. And even recently, they're now discovering that many of these massive dam projects, some like Three Gorges being among the largest dams in the world, are actually not solving the problems they were designed to solve. They've just had recent terrible flooding uh, in China that has not been uh, averted and has not been well managed by, um, by large dams. So given the harm to the environment that we know from previous experience, and given the fact that we've probably exhausted sites for major dams and irrigation projects, I think we have now entered an era in which our soundest remedies are integrated water resource management, where we assume that the water that we have is probably all the water that we're really going to get, except by using and reusing each and every drop as efficiently and as equitably and as effectively as we can and thinking of large water projects, irrigation districts, large impoundments, large diversion systems as measures of last resort, not measures of first resort. I'll add to that assessment that I think given the impending nature of climate change, that's really wise. We already see in the United States and many other places where our large dams that were built 40, 50, 80 years ago uh, are being hugely taxed by chronic drought. And, and uh, the fact that Hoover Dam, for example, in Lake Mead, insufficient water supply to guarantee deliveries to the seven states dependent on the Colorado River and Mexico. So I don't believe this is a panacea any longer. So integrated management, Thinking of dams and impoundments and irrigation systems as measures of last resort, not first resort. Fantastic, Thank you much, uh, Professor Feldman. Um, I don't know. If we have a uh, question. Um, well, we'll make sure to uh, to send you the question in, in any case. Um, we, we haven't got the time to, to go further with the questions, but I, I would like to thank you for your time and for this very, very interesting seminar that we had today. And hopefully uh, this conversation triggered the curiosity and the interest of people because water is a matter for everyone. Everyone sh should be included, included in the discussion. Everyone is entitled to an opinion and uh, I think uh, that seminars like this allow us to, to find uh, common, common points that, that, may, uh, that may pave the road towards an agreement with regards to this, this really, really special resource as, as is the water. Um, I think just to finalize, to finalize I, I would like to say to all the audience that this seminar is going, going to be translated to Spanish and is going to be published in our uh, page, in our YouTube channel and so on. So you can actually come back to it if needed. Uh, and more importantly, what I would like to say uh, to all of you, to, to Senator, uh, Senator Alejandra Leon, to uh, Congressman Diego del Bosque, to all of you, the society that, that were with, with us today, 
is that this is only the beginning of the discussion. This is only the beginning uh, of the of the of the new structure and the new uh, paradigm with regards to water in Mexico, and we obviously count with people like Professor Feldman to accompany this process um, because this process and this new, this new road needs, needs to be built with the best knowledge, with the best knowledge available in the world. And it's a process that, we, that, is, that belongs to all the Mexican society. And we are in IMTA very open to, uh, to trigger those discussions. I just, uh, so I, I fin finalized the seminar saying thank you. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Professor Feldman. And I finished the, 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 my intervention saying, with a saying, a very harsh saying that I learned in the Netherlands. But, and I say harsh because uh, I, I am sure that some of you are going to, 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 to make a face on me, but uh, they say that you can live without, without love, but you cannot live without water. And uh, reflect on that. Uh, and IMTA is ready uh, for the challenge with all of you, of course. And I think uh, the the communi communication team is uh, wants to 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 take a picture of, of all of us. So if all of you for the team to to take a picture uh, to to remind us of this uh, excellent morning. So, whenever you're you're ready, Marco. Okay, let's count to three, and Monica is going to help us. Vamos a contar hasta tres para tomar eh, un par de fotografías. Pues eh, agradecerles muchísimo su presencia y que formar parte de esta experiencia de conocimiento. Entonces ahora Monica nos va a ir indicando y muy atentos cuando escuchen el clic es que vamos a hacer una segunda toma y vamos a hacer tres tomas. In total, si están de acuerdo. Thank you very much. It was nice uh, being with you this morning. This is the first one. Esa fue la primera. Here comes the second one. Okay. Ready? And then the third one. Eh, la tercera, si, si gustan saludar a la cámara o hacer algún saludo a todos, de verdad que fue un gusto comp eh, compartir esta mañana con el con todos ustedes. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. It's been a great pleasure and honor. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, David. Thank Hopefully, you. we'll be the first of many. Gracias. Yes. I look forward to that. I truly do. And I big thanks to all of your great efforts. Your efforts yes, yes. in the water law is just really, really commendable. And any way that uh, I can help, please do let me know. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a, have a great day. You too. Stay safe.